Hey guys, today I'm going to be doing a series review on The Fall of the House of Usher. So before I head into my thoughts and feelings on this series, Fall of the House of Usher, a uh, quick disclaimer, I am definitely probably going to have spoilers at some point in this video. I'm going to try and have no spoilers at the top of this video. That way, if you have not seen the show, but you want to still kind of hear my thoughts about it, if it's worth your time. Um, yeah, so so no spoilers at the start. And I will warn you guys when I get into the, the, the more spoilery stuff, which would be kind of closer to the feelings of this particular video, I guess. Um, so yeah, let's get it going. Uh, my thoughts and feelings on the fall of the House of Usher. Uh, first of all, before I start this video, you guys, I am a huge fan of Edgar Allan Poe, which is what the Fall of the House of Usher TV series is about. Um, it, it's kind of this melding and meshing of a, a bunch of various different works by Edgar Allan Poe. Um, so yeah, I'm a huge fan of Edgar Allan Poe. I, I love his poetry, I love his short stories, and yeah, he even wrote uh, one novel, um, which I also read and enjoyed. Um, but yeah, I, I love Edgar Allan Poe so much. Let me show you some of my miscellaneous things that I have. <laughs> I obviously have my complete works of Edgar Allan Poe right here, this giant beast of a book. I even have these two little figures right here. There's like this one of Poe, and then the Funko Pop version of Poe right here, and he's holding like a raven if you can see it there. And then I even have this little mini plushy version of Poe that's squishy and plushy. <laughs> So yeah, I love all things Edgar Allan Poe, you guys. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say, heading into this show, I definitely had my concerns, how I was going to feel about this show, since I do love the works of Edgar Allan Poe so much. But on top of that, I was just also conflicted because uh, Mike Flanagan is the creator of this mini series, and I have previously loved and enjoyed um, the Haunting of Hill House and The Haunting of Bly Manor. Those are like two wonderful, amazing shows created by Mike Flanagan. And so yeah, Fall of the House of Usher is another creation by Mike Flanagan. So I, I did, I was like, oh, surely Mike Fl Flanagan won't mess this up. You know, it's like I, I was hoping for the best, you know, because he, he's really not disappointing me with the, the few things that I've seen from him. Um, so yeah, let's get into uh, my actual thoughts and feelings on The Fall of the House of Usher here. Um, if you don't know what it is about, <laughs> it is an eight-episode miniseries uh, on Netflix. And reading the IMDb plot summary here really quickly. To secure their fortune and future, two ruthless siblings build a family dynasty that begins to crumble when their heirs mysteriously die one by one. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's not really much of a spoiler there. The the synopsis alone is letting you know, hey, uh, everybody is like just, you know, casually dying off here one by one, <laughs> which is so fascinating. Um, but yeah, you guys, wow. This miniseries, uh, I had my I had my doubts, I had my concerns, I had my worries, but wow, this was an incredible masterpiece by Mike Flanagan. Um, I, I was looking to see if he wrote every single episode. It, it looked like he wrote every single episode, but he also had a partner with him writing every episode, and it looked like he directed the episodes more than anything. Um, just, wow, <laughs> you guys. This was an incredible, imaginative retelling of the works of Edgar Allan Poe. Because even though the show is called The Fall of the House of Usher, um, that is really kind of the frame narrative device of this, of this entire series. Uh, the, the short story, The Fall of the House of Usher, um, uh, it, it's, it's all about an, uh, an, an unnamed narrator who goes to, f to visit his friend Robert Usher, and you quickly find out that his twin sister Madeline Usher has died mysteriously, and so uh, the unnamed narrator is, is spending the entire short story with Roderick Usher, and little pieces are kind of being filled in, and yet the story ultimately ends, you know, with the, the destruction ultimately of the fall of the House of Usher and whatnot. So that short story is kind of the big framework device that's used for the entirety of this miniseries, which I think works wonderfully well. 
and yeah I just I just absolutely loved how all of these short stories and the poetry uh, and even Poe's one novel I, I really liked how all of it just melded and meshed just so geniusly and intelligently together into a cohesive story because I was I was genuinely kind of worried when I found out that each episode was going to kind of be taking inspiration from a short story I kind of was initially kind of worried like well is that going to be cohesive you know it, it just seemed like it was a lot and it wasn't going to work and I, I was just trying to figure out how is that going to all kind of connect you know and yeah Mike Flanagan and his team they somehow made it work <laughs> because it nothing ever felt forced is what I'm trying to say nothing ever ever felt forced or out of place or just weird you know considering that this is a mashup of, of short stories all together you know all these characters just kind of colliding in interesting ways you know um it, it just all somehow works I, I i don't know how it just does <laughs> and at the core of this narrative what this whole story is about it's about this this family this dynasty the house of usher this family who are just so absolutely <laughs> despicable and they're all terrible people and yeah the, i think part of the fun and entertainment of this show is you know how are they all going to die because as the synopsis says you know they're all going to die so it's kind of the thing of well how exactly and i, I think i think in some ways when you see the episode titles i think Think you're going to kind of figure it out fairly quickly and early on how each person is going to die so it almost does kind of ruin it to a degree especially if you know your Poe um, but still it's kind of the thing of within the context of the show what is the imaginative retelling version of that of how they're going to die exactly you know um, so so yeah like I said the, the, the core of the crux of the show is about this really highly dysfunctional just terrible group of, of people the, the the house of usher and whatnot and, and 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 yeah through flashbacks various different flashbacks you you get reveals about how uh roderick and madeline usher who are siblings you, you get these flashbacks over the course of the entire show how it is they build up this dynasty how they build up their wealth and fortune and this this business um the business is is, is like a it's called fortunato which is a hint there for some poe right there um it's like a pharmaceutical company so you you get slowly all these answers you know how this these siblings their ruthlessness um they're they're manipulating how they get control of this company make it their own build up their dynasty uh essentially um and yeah how that all slowly kind of starts to crumble and fall apart and why exactly it's doing that which is another big thing that gets revealed it's not all just random you know there's 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 a deeper kind of nefarious thing at play in the background that just truly totally works um and yeah uh, kind of reading off some of my notes here you know kind of the themes being presented in this show um there it's it's about abuses of power and wealth and it's a huge commentary the commentary kind of just comes out of nowhere in the in the finale of this show but you know once you think about it it's like a, a totally makes sense it, it is it's a huge commentary on like the state of the world essentially and our, our obsession with vanity and commodities and wealth greed um even immortality to some extent you know our desire to be immortal and to preserve ourselves no matter the cost you know so this show is kind of tackling a lot but it, it all kind of boils down to this very wealthy privileged family and that, that abuse of power essentially and which ultimately leads to their destruction you know um and this show if you've seen haunting hill house and haunting of bly manor I don't think this show is anywhere near as scary as those two shows in particular um it, it definitely has its moments of thrills and jump scares and chills and whatnot and definitely the gore there's a lot of gore in this show um but i still don't think it's anywhere near as scary to be quite honest because the way a lot of this show works it's it's really more like darkly humorous and darkly morbid because since this family they're all just so terrible and unlikable and they're so dysfunctional and as i was saying part of the entertainment is seeing how they're all going to get their com comeuppance and die <laughs> you know so it's all done in a manner that's just kind of uh, 
hilarious, morbidly hilarious at times. And uh, it's, I guess, kind of a question of do you feel any sort of pity for them, any sort of sympathy, or yet yeah, is it all rightly deserved? Um, so, yeah, I, I, I guess I, I, I totally recommend this show. If you love all things Edgar Allan Poe, if you have previously enjoyed Mike Flanagan's other works, especially Hill House and Bly Manor, um, this is definitely very different from those, I think. I, I think there's definitely there's nuances that carry over, you know, like just the, the writing style, the directing style, the cast. You know, a lot of this cast has been in other works with by Mike Flanagan and whatnot. There's a lot of parallels and similarities, you know, themes and whatnot. Um, so I think you'll definitely enjoy that. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I definitely recommend this. And I do, I want to get into the more spoilery stuff where I'm going to talk about pretty much kind of each individual character and kind of the character, or sorry, each individual episode, I should say. I'm going to talk about each, each individual episode and kind of the characters within that. Um, so, so yeah, like I said, spoilers are ahead where I'm going to be getting into all the deaths and whatnot and some of the big reveals, I suppose. Okay, so. Uh, the very first episode is called A Midnight Dreary, which is like the opening line of Poe's The Raven, the classic The Raven. You know, if, if you don't know Poe, most people know The Raven, at least. Because <laughs> I've talked to people before and I'll say, oh, I love Edgar Allan Poe, and they'll be like, oh, The Raven guy? <laughs> okay, so A Midnight Dreary opens up uh, this show, and yeah, what an introduction to this show, because it immediately goes into flashback mode, and we see young Roderick and Madeline Usher and their really like overly religious zealous mother who kind of dies uh, kind of randomly in some ways and um, yeah their early connection to the Fortunato company um, and, and yeah we, we immediately through these flashbacks kind of start building up to there, there is a deeper mystery lingering uh, that we don't we don't know just yet you know there's like gaps in the flashbacks that kind of get filled in and whatnot um, so yeah um Clayton, Roderick, and Madeline Usher. In the flashbacks, we have Zach Gilford and Willa Fitzgerald. Um, I love them as the younger versions of Roderick and Madeline. They were great. And yet their older counterparts are played by Bruce, uh, Bruce Greenwood and Mary McDonald. Bruce Greenwood was amazing. <laughs> I loved him as Roderick Usher. You know, just, I, I, I could feel that he was the patriarch of this family, you know. And then, yet, yeah, Mary McDonald, wow. I, I've not seen her in anything since Battlestar Galactica, you guys. I, I'm sure she's been in other things since Battlestar Galactica. But yeah, this is the first thing I've seen her in since Battlestar Galactica, to be quite honest. It's, it's been a while. Um, the, the character of Roderick, you know, on the surface, you kind of get the idea like, oh, he's the one in charge, he's the one doing everything. But really, it's actually Madeline Usher who is in charge of this family in some ways. She's the one kind of, uh, she's the most ambitious. You know, Roderick is ambitious in his own way, but you quickly get the idea that Madeline is far more the more ambitious one. And, and it, it, she does seem to have more of a obsession with, I think, vanity and wealth and immortality you know because i mean as we see in the concluding episode you know she's she was doing something with artificial intelligence you know um with, with lenore and whatnot um and then playing um this mysterious figure named verna um which if you had if you, while you were watching the show if you didn't figure it out verna is an anagram for raven <laughs> so playing verna slash the raven however you want to think about it is Carla G uh, Gugino. Uh, Carla Gugino, except she's in every damn Mike Flanagan show, you guys. Well, Carla G Gugino, wow, she was breathtaking in this show. She, it's just so gorgeous, too. She has just aged so gracefully. She is absolutely gorgeous. She, this, this character of Verna just is constantly popping in and out of the lives of the, the Usher family. And it, it kind of takes a while for you to kind of figure out why exactly. You know, you do get those answers in there. And I, I at first, was not quite sure what the hell Verna was supposed to be, you know, because I figured she's supposed to be kind of this manifestation manifestation of the raven. And a lot of times the raven represents, like, death and whatnot, you know, whenever I think about a raven. So she is this manifestation of something that's not necessarily evil, you know, but neither is she good. She is this, like, neutral figure and her actions almost seem evil and nefarious but in reality they're kind of not you know when you consider the usher family you know they're 
their personalities and their agendas and their motivations. You know, they are the true evil of this show in some ways. And, and Rana is kind of this character that's there to, like, get retribution and justice or something. You know, she's a very neutral figure and with kind of just kind of one goal there. Um, yeah, she's, she's definitely not evil. You know, I definitely would not consider her evil at all. Uh, she's like an, an avenging angel, almost, it seems. It's kind of hard to describe her, but I, I, did, I loved Carla Gugino, her, her function and role in this show, because it's very minimal at first, and then every episode she pops up at, at some point, you know, to, to kind of get into the heads of these characters and whatnot. Um, so yeah, a really fantastic opening to this this show with a midnight dreary and then moving into um the second episode we have the mask of the red death which is a short story um and in that short story it follows like this um kingdom and this there's like a plague that's occurred and uh the king in this kingdom he, he gets like all the nobles into this castle and they're all like locked up in there away from the plague but in the meantime you know everybody else is out there dying but they're going to have this great party of plague going on and of course here comes uh, uh the red death and everybody eventually dies <laughs> um so in this reimagine reimaginative retelling of the mask of the red death we're following the character of perry um who is a son who, who's that he's actually considered a bastard son of robert gusher um played by sir sir ryan S S Cicada? I'm not quite sure how to pronounce his name. Um, oh boy, Perry was really despicable. Uh, yeah, he, he, he's really vain and, you know, part of that generation so obsessed with looking good and uh, talking about their lives and how great it is and taking photos and filming themselves, you know, and having wild, crazy, expensive parties. Yeah, Perry was an absolute nuisance, but yeah, still a wonderful performance. I, I'm going to be talking about all these characters you know they're all despicable and terrible but yet the performance is wow <laughs> uh yeah uh, that ending with perry um like i said if you know your poe you're going to kind of figure out how some of these characters are going to die you know it's just a matter of kind of what's the twist how, how is it going to go down exactly and i loved how this was because it is it's this party for all these wealthy privileged teens and youngsters you know anybody with money and uh yeah getting their comeuppance because um, he wanted to have like this water effect um, from the sprinkler system and whatnot going on and boy oh boy does that go wrong because coming out from the sprinklers instead of the water is uh, what was it supposed to be I, at first I thought it was acid I thought it was like acid or whatever but it was supposed to be like like just like chemical dumping from I, I guess the pharmaceutical company something like that um, I guess still producing a sort of acid, I suppose. Either way, it was chemical and it wasn't good. So yeah, oh lord, that ending of that episode with the, that, 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 all that come down, getting all over all these people, melting off their skin and their faces, and yeah, oh lord, um, uh, Frederick's poor wife, dear god, I, I felt so much sympathy for Frederick's poor wife, because she didn't just you know, even though she's part of the family, she did not deserve that at all. I mean, really, none of those people, I feel like none of those people deserved it. It, it. Really, it was just Perry, you know, it's like Perry's obsession and his vanity and all that. It's like, because of that, he ends up killing all these other poor innocent people in some ways, you know, and it's really just targeted at him. But, oh Lord, that was so gruesome, and just all the piles of bodies, when they show it later, all the bodies just lying all melted together. Oh Lord, the effects on that are so, so, so good. Um, and then moving into episode uh, three, we have Murder in the Rue Morgue, another short story. Um, and what I remember from Murder in the Rue Morgue, because this is a story with the character of Dupin, um, and I, I like the, 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 who the murder ends up being, it ends up being like a, an orangutan, you know? <laughs> so I like how they did this. Once again, knowing who the murder culprit was going to be, how, how uh, the character of Camille was going to die, you know, how she was going to die kind of was obvious. Um, but yeah, the character of Camille is the one being focused on in this particular episode, a daughter of Robert Usher, played by Kate, uh, uh, Kate Siegel, Kitty Siegel, um, who's like married to Mike Flanagan, you guys, she, she's always in everything. 
Um, I, I, the character of Camille, she was just so zany and weird to me. She she just definitely abuses of power all over the place with her character. And yes, the way she was like manipulating and controlling and sleeping around with her two um, associates that worked for her assistants. Dear God, that was just totally horrible. I was so glad when they were like, hey, um, we don't want to do this no longer. And she's like, fine, you're fired. <laughs> I'm so glad. Because uh, they did not deserve that crap at all. Um, uh, yeah, Camille ultimately ends up getting killed uh, by a chimpanzee, which was great. I loved it because uh, her her half sister Victorine, you know, doing like the experimentations and trying to get that heart, um, that little heart monitor or whatever that was, you know, in the chimps. But yeah, just kind of killing the chimps one by one. Um, so yeah, the chimps, the chimps getting their justice at the end of the day, yay! And yeah, Camille kind of being a result of their their ire, you know, and she ends up getting killed. And it was great. I loved it <laughs> once again. Great like effects going on there and that intensity I loved I loved how that was shot when it showed that angle of Camille holding up the camera and then she, when it flashes and you see the chimp in the camera because she was previously talking to Verna but Verna was actually the chimp you know <laughs> it was so good I loved it and I did mention because I'm murdering the room morgue because it's a it's a the a detective story with the character of Dupin um I haven't talked about Carl Lum Carl Lumley yet who plays the character of uh, Dupin. Um, I, I really loved Carl Lumley in, in this show and his function and role because um, he's investigating the, the Usher family and yeah he actually has a really long backstory with the Usher family and yeah we eventually kind of get that reveal there you know that betrayal by Robert and Madeline which is just devastating and heartbreaking and it's like you get it you know where he's coming from you know uh yeah uh, Dupont was a fantastic character and I, I loved every episode you know it would show him and Bruce Greenwood together just in that room you know in the, the ancestral home of the ushers you know just always uh, following the two of them and their conversations and yeah Dupont just constantly constantly being like okay what the hell is going on you said you're gonna reveal all to me but it's taking forever it's gonna take eight episodes <laughs> um so so yeah moving on to the next episode the black another short story uh and yeah i mean this one's pretty obvious it, it's about a man there's a black cat and uh, some terrible things go down with this cat he's abusive to this cat and the cat gets its revenge eventually by the end of the story so yeah this story definitely plays out pretty much exact i, I think out of all of the episodes and the individual stories i think that i think this episode follows the original story probably the closest in some ways um so in this one, we have the character of Leo, played by uh, Rahul Kohli, um, and he's like an, a gamer. He, he doesn't do anything else with his life but play games and make money for it. <laughs> Which, I mean, good for him, I guess. Um, so it, it's a, in this episode, his, his boyfriend has, has a black cat, and uh, he, he just gets really obsessive with this cat. He, he cannot stand this cat, and the cat is constantly kind of tormenting him and scratching him and hurting him. Um, and oh lord that whole ending of the episode was just so great with, with him picking up Thor's hammer you guys I love the use of Thor's hammer in this episode it was genius <laughs> and yeah, he's taking that hammer pounding out the walls and beating them in and yeah he sees that cat on the balcony he dives out to the balcony like Thor in some ways I love that visual and yeah he, he, he splats to the ground <laughs> Um, I, I love, I really enjoyed this episode the, uh, as well, and the use of the cat. Like I said, this is the most close uh, interpretation, I think, of the original story, you know, uh, which I in particular enjoyed. Um, then the next episode, we have the Telltale Heart, uh, focusing on the character of Victorine, played by Tiana Miller. Um, I, I love the original Telltale Heart, you know, a, a, a dude murders his neighbor, buries him in the floorboards, but he keeps hearing that heart you know and he eventually kind of betrays himself to the police you know like oh i have a body down here i killed somebody <laughs> so yeah this story definitely kind of plays out pretty similar as well because victorine is having an argument with her her, her wife she accidentally kills her wife you guys that was horrible oh dear lord uh, it's like i totally saw it coming up you know um and yeah then victorine just kind of throughout the entire episode is just slowly be being driven to madness and she can hear that um that uh, machine that she's created, a little heart machine that she puts in the chimpanzees and whatnot. She just keeps hearing that that beeping sound over and over and over. You know, it's literally driving her mad. And yeah, the episode ending, and we see that she's kept the body of her wife, and she's inserted that that um 
little heart machine or whatever it was called <laughs> and uh, it, you know this is the one time that Roderick actually kind of first hand witnesses things going down with his children you know because everybody else if I'm not mistaken you know he doesn't see any of the other deaths happen this is the first time that he sees the death of one of his children because you know Victorine you know just being slowly driven madness and she takes she takes a knife right and she takes it and just she kills herself and that's suicide um yeah tell to heart I, I love this episode as well how it all played out once again knowing Poe I kind of figured out the trajectory you know but it was still kind of the joy of well how's it gonna play out exactly you know um then the the next episode gold bug you guys um i still really highly enjoyed this episode but gold bug is one of those short stories by poe that i honestly just don't remember i had to get on wikipedia <laughs> and do a quick like search and a synopsis for the gold bug because i just can't remember the gold bug that much and out of all of the episodes i'm still a little confused about the connection here because the the character of Tamerlane played by Samantha Sloyam her, she's built up like this um company with her husband and it's called Goldbug and so there is like this, this symbol of like uh, like kind of like an Egyptian Egyptian scarab it looks like and it's gold like Goldbug obviously um so I mean that is the connection to Poe there with the title and with the bug um, but yeah, I mean, as far as everything else with the character of Tamerlane, I, I just didn't see any of the Poe connection or references. I mean, unless I'm honestly just forgetting something, because the character of Tamerlane, I, she was just so weird and interesting because it, it's like she has a husband, but she doesn't want to sleep with her husband at all. It seems like it seems like she just wants to see like prostitutes or escorts come and talk with her husband and sleep with her husband and, and it's like she gets her jollies off by watching that and i was just really con confused about that whole thing and what's the connection with poe there and the actual connection with the gold bug story you know uh, i mean if, if, if you guys have any deeper insight into gold bug you know the, the deeper poe connection there other than just the bug <laughs> you know feel free to kind of share and explain it with me because i was just really having a hard time with that episode like I said it wasn't a bad episode it's still a really fantastic episode I just didn't ultimately I just didn't get the overall how it connects to Poe you know uh, but yeah Tamerlane definitely gets her her comeuppance at the end of this episode as well you know uh, she's kind of being driven slowly to madness by Verna as well and uh yeah she's getting on that bed she's busting all the glass she falls she gets impaled by several shards of glass it was great I loved it. Yay. <laughs> and then the next episode, The Pit and the Pendulum. Yes, I love this. Uh, there, there's a deeper historical context within the Poe story because it takes place during, I think, like the Spanish Inquisition and it follows a guy who's been captured and he's just trapped in this dark, empty room and he, he, he figures out there's a big pit in the center of the prison that he's in. And then, yeah, he gets tied down at some point and, yeah, there's a pendulum swinging across that's about to kill him you know so I, I was definitely really intrigued about this episode uh, this episode being Henry Thomas's episode where he plays the character of Frederick um his death was just so satisfying because the character of Frederick he, he just is such a, a he just wants to please his his dad he just wants everything in the world handed to him yeah he treated his daughter and his wife just atrociously yeah guys oh my god so yeah his death was just so satisfying uh because uh, verna managed to you know get the uh that paralytic into the uh the, what was it cocaine or something i'm not sure what he was taking um and he was just laying there paralyzed at that warehouse you know the perry's warehouse where he was having that party because it's about to get demolished and just such a great visual of him just laying there he can't do anything you know it's, this is what he's done to his wife he's been paralyzing his wife in that hospital bed where she can't do or say anything so there he is just laying there and yeah, as the building's crumbling a big chunk of it just swinging away and then yeah slowly cutting into him it's just so gruesome and so great but yeah i, I love the comeuppance uh, the character of frederick got right there it was wonderful it was glorious and then yeah the last episode being called the raven so at this point in the show all the usher kids they're all freaking dead you guys it's been wonderful so this is the episode we finally get you know more of the backstory with roderick and madeline and 
how they, how everything has led up to this, you know, that they had a conversation years ago with Ivana. She promised them, you know, wealth and power, but at some point, their entire line, all of their heirs, would die. Um, and then, yeah, then they in turn would die, and it would be the end of House of Usher and whatnot. So I'm, I love what the show is exploring with that whole concept, because it, it is, it's a big thing of, you know, what would you do for wealth and power? What are you willing to give up at the end of the day, you know? And it does, it just shows just the obsession that Robert and Madeline have, their, their egos and their sense of self-importance, um, and, and the fact that they just don't really care for anybody else, you know, but themselves, and their future and the fortune that they want to amass and who they want to get back at, you know, it really just goes to show who they are deep down, you know, that they're willing to just be like, yeah, fine, kill off our heirs, it don't matter, <laughs> you know, but I mean, at the same time, that's they're also so obsessed with family legacy, you know, they're so obsessed with family legacy as well, and their line continuing, and their heirs getting the Fortunato company, you know, but, yeah, it's like they did, they took it all for a joke at first, you know, they didn't believe Ivana at first, is kind of my impression, and, yeah, later, later they regretted that, you know, and they, they finally understand the mistake they've made, um, so, so yeah, this episode being called The Raven, we have a massive amount of, of The Raven references, you know, and basically kind of for sure saying, hey, Verna is a raven. <laughs> um, and yeah, I love how The Raven was just quoted alone in this episode. Um, um, and yeah, poor Lenore. Yeah, guys, oh my god, Lenore was an unfortunate casual casualty to this whole thing. Uh, Lenore being the daughter of Frederick. Uh, Le Lenore was the best of the ushers, you guys, and it's just such a tragedy and such a shame that Lenore had to suffer the consequences of Roderick and Mad Madeline's actions, you know, and I think that's a big part of, you know, Ro Ro Roderick definitely feels really guilty and ashamed about that because he, he loves Lenore, you know, he, he it seems like he doesn't really particularly love his own children, but he loves Lenore, I think, you know, um, and I love that whole thing with Verna going personally to Lenore and saying, hey, you know, your life is, 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 is purposeful and meaningful, and yet yeah, talking about her, how her mother is going to live and open up like that domestic charity um, um, thing, you know, taking care of other domestic abuse survivors and women and stuff, you know, you know, Lenore's name being put on that and whatnot. Um, so, and I did, I loved kind of the, the simplicity of Lenore's death, you know, the ease of her death and that it's not painful. You know, everybody else suffers horrible, agonizing deaths and all Verna does is, you know, just touch her forehead and she just, she just dies, you know, so just quickly with, with no suffering, no pain, you know. Um, so, so yeah, Lenore was definitely a horrible tragedy. Um, and uh, I've not talked, I've not talked about Mark Hamill yet, you guys. Um, Mark Hamill is playing like, um, he's like their lawyer, right? I guess he, uh, he, he does all the dirty work for the ushers and he keeps things in line and in order and he takes away all of the chaos. Um, Mark Hamill is playing the character of Arthur Pym and Arthur Pym, um, this is the short, this is the novel, the one novel that, that wrote. It was called The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym. And yeah, that story is about the character of Arthur Pym, who's like a sailor. And uh, he gets like stuck on an island, if I'm not mistaken. And there's like cannibals on this island. Um, so that's kind of incorporated into Pym's backstory as well, that he went on like some sort of Arctic expedition at some point in his life. Uh, and he eventually started working for the Ushers. Um, uh, Mark Hamill was so good in this role. I do wish they had done more. It's like you have Mark Hamill use the man. <laughs> so I wish they would have used him a little bit more and, and whatnot, but what little he was there, I think he was very highly effective. And yeah, I mean, just like the final episode alone, that conversation he has with Ivana, where she's offering him, hey, I can help you. You don't have to suffer the consequences, you know. Um, but he, he has no collateral. You know, that's kind of just it he has no collateral to give Verna in return and it seems like he's okay with that and he's at peace you know um and yeah he does he gets arrested at the very end he goes to jail um once again it seems like he's at peace 
the fact, you know. Um, he's willing to kind of take that responsibility, and he understands that, you know, compared to the ushers. You know, the ushers did not want to claim any sort of responsibility. They wanted to just keep getting out of their horrible situations, you know. So that does, I think that makes Kion a, a much more likable, related, relatable character, that he doesn't take Verna up on that offer at the end, you know. So yeah, fantastic performance by Mark Hamill. Um, and then, yeah, also in just um, flashbacks, we have the character of Griswold, played by Michael Trudeau, who I've not seen in anything either since Battlestar Galactica. I can't believe there were two Battlestar Galactica people, but Battlestar Galactica people in this show. Um, I really loved Michael Trudeau as Griswold, because in the flashbacks, he's the head of Fortunato, and um, I, I had a feeling, I predicted it fairly early, you guys. The first time they showed Roderick staring at that uh, bricked up wall, I kept thinking about the cask of Amontillado, because a character gets buried alive. Um, behind a brick wall. I kept thinking about that story and I kept thinking, I bet Roderick and Madeline in the finale, they team up, dispose of Griswold, and he gets placed behind that brick wall. Alive, buried alive essentially, you know, and sure enough that did come to pass and it was so satisfying. I loved it. <laughs> uh, and once again, if you know your Poe, there's certain story beats that this show takes that you'll kind of figure out fairly quickly at some point in the narrative and yeah the character of Griswold was definitely one of those I knew he was going to get buried behind that wall you know it wasn't it wasn't a surprise you know it definitely was not a surprise but it was still very satisfying um is, is that it uh, I yeah I, I liked how the the raven ended even though it was taking its title from the, the poem the raven still it goes right back around to the fall of the house of usher story um and yeah roderick oh lord yeah him thinking he killed madeline but he didn't and there she she comes out all bloody he's taken out her eyes all that egyptian mythology you know there was all that egyptian mythology going on that i loved um, and yeah, Madeline comes out, tackles her brother, and yeah, the house, Dupont manages to, to leave the house just in time, like the unnamed narrator from the original story, and yeah, he witnesses the fall of the house of Usher and whatnot, and yeah, that's, that's it, that's the end of the Ushers, and it was so satisfying and so well done, I loved it. <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 I could sit here and gush forever about the show, because I think there's so much stuff that can be richly analyzed and thought about when you really think about it uh, because there, there's just there's numerous Poe references you guys there's too many to even count you know because people like place names people names just all sorts of things if you know your Poe it, it's all over the place um but yeah I absolutely love this miniseries it, it was just spectacular you guys I, I love the directing the writing uh, I, I love the, the humor the dark humor of it and whatnot a great fantastic cast and once again if you love all things Edgar Allan Poe I think I don't think you're going to be disappointed with this show I, I think it's such a remarkable re imaginative retelling of Poe's stories and how they all mesh and blend it, it's just it's just a masterpiece I think and it just totally works I was just so pleasantly surprised I was so happy um I, I think I, I I left I left this show with like a smile on my face you know i had a smile on my face as it concluded it was not good <laughs> so you guys that is it for my thoughts and feelings on the fall of the house of usher in the comments below have you guys watched this mini series um and what did you think about it did you love it did you hate it just let me know your thoughts so that's it for this video don't forget to like comment and subscribe if you like this video you know like these other videos bye guys